Okay, and we are live. So thanks, everybody, for joining us once again for an Open Worm Journal Club, this time Movie Magic with Elegant Worms. We're going to talk about uh, exciting new methods to capture the behavior of C. elegans, quantify them, and do a whole lot of statistics and, and the scientific insight that is derived from that. Today, uh, presenting, we will have Dr. Ev Mini, who will introduce himself in a moment. But first, we have an illustrious panel of folks who are going to be asking Ev the tough questions uh, during the session. So um, let's introduce them now, and let's start with Adam Calhoun. Hi, I'm Adam. Uh, I Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. OK. <laughs> uh, I'm at the Salk Institute in UC San Diego, and I study learning and decision making in C. elegans in the Sri Kant Chalasani lab. Oh, nice. Great to have you. OK, hello, everybody. My name is Balaj. Uh, I'm from Hungary, but I'm currently studying at the University of Edinburgh, where I'm doing a PhD in computational neuroscience in the lab of uh, Matt Nolan. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Knudsen. I'm a uh, postdoctoral researcher at UCSD here in San Diego. Uh, I actually study auditory perception in songbirds uh, using behavior and electrophysiology, but I've uh, started getting really interested in open worm where I'm trying to help uh, kind of organize the biological data side of things. Great, great to have you. Jim? Hi, my name is uh, Jim Hokinson. Uh, I am at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I am currently uh, working on my PhD in neural engineering, and I'm hoping to help out Open Worm uh, with the behavioral uh, data and analysis of that behavioral data. Great. And I'm Stephen Larson. I'm Open Worm project coordinator. Vanessa? Uh, hi, my name is Vanessa. I am in Santa Ana, California, and uh, I'm the executive assistant for Metacell. So I'm here to. Uh, to help with the process and uh, be involved with supporting the Open Worm project. Great to have you all. OK, so now let's turn to Ev to introduce himself and uh, sure. oh, check out the des description. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Ev Yamini. I'm now at uh, Columbia University doing my postdoctoral work with Oliver Hobart on uh, neural fate in, um, in worms. And uh, I did my PhD with uh, uh, Bill Schaefer at um, Initially at UCSC, then we moved to Cambridge um, at the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology. And so I'm going to be talking to you about that PhD work now. And um, if I can get everything working, let's try this screen share again and pray that it works. <laughs> OK, so now you should see my desktop. Um, and where did I put my presentation? OK, and let me do you, I hope you guys can see the. Um, the presentation now. Is that correct? I still see your face. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, that's uh, Close. unfortunate. <laughs> okay. Let me uh, let me see if that. So let me try this again. Screen share, and I say desktop, and I start my screen share. Okay. Yes. And then I am going to try this again. No, it's good. Okay. Good to go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> I'm very bad with this technology, even though I build technology. So it's uh, <laughs> the irony is pretty striking. <laughs> um, okay, so I, yeah, once again, my name is Evgeny. I'm going to be talking to you about work that I did during my PhD um, about getting to know a few worms, and it's basically a database of C. elegans behavioral phenotypes. So I'll try to go as slowly as possible because I know some of the audience definitely don't understand worms. Maybe some of the terms are foreign. Um, so I'll, I'll hope the moderators stop me if I'm going too fast or stop me if I'm going too slow. Um, I'm just going to start with the big picture, and hopefully this is one of the few slides that has no uh, pictures on it itself. Um, but hopefully you can follow most of the stuff. Um, basically, I'm going to be talking to you about us uh, measuring 300 mutant strains of worms. What we wanted to do is quantitatively measure precise phenotypes. So we wanted to understand the exact look and feel of these mutant worms. Um, Many of them just have single gene mutations, and by understanding what they look like, we can hope to understand what those genes are actually doing. Um, we wanted to map the genotype to the phenotype. And what that means is 
um, what do the mutated genes end up actually doing to the worms? You know, so you got this one gene and you mutate it and you kind of curious to understand what happens as a result of the worm, to the worm's behavior, what it looks like. Um, and conversely, we'd like to project, uh, predict the genetics from the phenotype. So, you know, if we understand actually what these mutated worms look like, um, and if several of them look similarly, then potentially those worms that look similar um, and behave similarly have uh, genes that are altered that, that interact in a pathway or, or somehow, um, you know, basically there's some signaling that, that uh, co-occurs between these genes. Um, and then with all that information, we'd also like to build an extensive and intensive worm phenome. So we'd like to catalog as much as we can about what it means to be a worm. You know, how does a, a normal worm behave? What are all the things that they can actually do? Um, and of course, I'd like to automate and high throughput everything uh, so that I don't have to do any work and it just does itself. But that is more of a pipe dream than a reality. So let's talk about uh, the what and why of the worm and get some background in so that uh, people understand what this talk is actually about. Okay. What is the C. elegans? So this is what the worm actually looks like when it's uh, beautifully photographed. This image is all over the internet. They live in uh, rotting fruit, um, or in the case of uh, a lab, they live on a petri dish eating bacteria. They go through four larval stages to reach their adulthood, and you can see that in this image here. Um, can you guys see my uh, mouse pointer on the screen? Kind of. I hope so. Yes, it's okay. tiny. It's well, tiny. Yeah. I wish there was a way to make it bigger, but it won't matter now, but later on I, I think it might matter. Um, but hopefully everyone knows what I'm talking about in, in the various parts. Um, so yeah, so it goes through these four larval stages to reach its adulthood um, in about three days, which is great because, you know, this is a full-grown organism which can uh, give birth to new organisms, basically to babies, within three days. Um, and that means that if you're doing genetics within it, you can have your mutant very quickly, actually, uh, which is why we care about it, or one of the many reasons we care about it. Um, just to give you a sense of the size, it's only about a millimeter long when it's an adult, and they're harmless to us. Um, and they're mostly hermaphrodite, which means they self-fertilize. So let's say you alter the genetics. Those genetics can be fairly stable because you have one organism giving rise to multiple uh, uh, progeny. And essentially, from one generation to the next, there's just not much change in the genetics, which is why we like it. Um, they've got a relatively well-defined set of simple behaviors. And uh, the wild type strain, uh, which is what we use as our control for experiments, is called N2. It was isolated in the 1950s. And it has its own beautiful little story where in which it was isolated by a researcher named uh, Elias Doherty. He took it all the way to Berkeley. Uh, then Sidney Brenner back in Cambridge uh, wanted one, so he asked for Elias to send it back to him in England. So it went round trip from England to Berkeley to back again to uh, Cambridge from Bristol. And uh, that progenitor, that N2, that wild type is all all, sorry, the controls that we use now are direct descendants of that wild type. So you can think about how many generations took place with it uh, propagating itself every three days for us to be using the, the you know, great, 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 I don't know what grandchild of the original one that traveled um, to the United States and back again to England. So why would we work with the worm? Uh, this picture I stole off of some neuroinformatics uh, website, but... Um, it's one that I think we've seen in Scientific American and on Open Worm. This is basically the nervous system of the worm. Um, and below it is another picture here that I took myself. Um, just to give you a sense that when we show these pictures here of what the model looks like, the reality isn't really that different. Um, this is the head of a worm. Um, I have uh, put in a fluorescent reporter into several of the neurons. Oh, sorry, I haven't, but somebody else put a fluorescent reporter into the several neurons that are in the head. And you can clearly see them labeled, and you can even see the... Uh, the tracts, the projections extending from them into the head and uh, and all the way to the tip of the nose almost. Um, there's 302 neurons in this worm and the wiring is known, sorry, in the maphrodite, in the delta maphrodite. Um, it's easy to manipulate the genetics. You simply inject your DNA construct into the worm, into its gonads, and then you have, you know, in the next generation already, some display of those mutant genetics. Um, there are 20,000 protein coding genes and they bear 80% homology to humans. So basically, if you find a gene in a worm and you understand what it does, that may, or sorry, with, with some likelihood, 
that has bearings on human genetics as well. So understanding stuff more means to some extent that you might understand what it does in humans as well. And um, in terms of these 20,000 protein coding genes, there's a repository that you can get nearly 8,000 of them from. Uh, sorry, where you can get knockouts for nearly 8,000 of them. So what does that mean? Basically, uh, people have gone to the trouble to take a wild-type worm and just mutate a single gene within it and then distribute that. So if you say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this gene, maybe it's uh, associated with autism in human beings, and I want to know what it's doing in a worm, so I want to find the worm which is all normal except for that gene being messed up, you can potentially order that from a central repository and it's at your lab uh, less than a week later. You can look to see how that worm behaves differently than a normal worm. Start to explore what's different about that worm. What does that gene actually do with it? Um, and then we're looking at behaviors. We're looking at phenotypes of worm. And a lot of people say, hey, uh, does a worm even do anything? Um, it does a little bit. <laughs> so here you can see a worm kind of moving along. Uh, let me know if you can't see the video. But uh, you can see that worms uh, move forward. They move backwards. It was a reversal just a little while back. Its head here is, is guiding it forward. And it does these things called omega turns where it's going to touch its body in reverse. We'll probably see one coming up pretty soon. Um, right. Oh, this one just reversed. Let's see if it's going to. Yeah. So it reversed and then it's an omega turn. This is what we call a pirouette, it's changing its direction. Um, so among the things that they tend to do, you can see it's head kind of poking around, looking, sensing its environment, and that's called foraging. Um, they move around, they do these turns, they look for mates and food, and they avoid repulsive cues. They defecate a lot. So every 45 seconds, like clockwork, these worms uh, will defecate if they're on food. This one happens to not be on food, so you won't see any defecation here. They lay eggs. Um, they nictate under certain conditions, so if things go wrong, they'll stand up on their tail, and they pray for a flight to a better place. And there's a nice paper which shows that uh, Drosophila, fruit flies, can come by and worms will, nictating worms will stick to them, and they can pick them up and move them to other places. Here. And then uh, there's actually a host of behaviors that we don't know about, because all the behaviors we've identified are just by human beings looking at them and saying, oh, this is something interesting, this is something that a worm does differently. Um, but Andre's work using uh, this large collection that I'll talk to you about in a second shows that there are behavioral motifs for which we don't have names, uh, and when, when which you, if you look at it, you say, oh, I don't even know what this one is doing. I didn't even know that was a thing, you know? So it's quite clear that there's a lot that's escaped our attention. Let me go on to the next slide. So I'd like to start with the results um, of the paper. So what have we actually done with our worms? Because I think that's the most important stuff. And later on, if we have time, we can actually get to how we do some of these, uh, these things. This is the worm tracker that I built doing my PhD. It's a set of hardware. And here you can see, hopefully you can see my pointer. This is a Petri dish. And the worm is on this little Petri dish um, crawling around. This Petri dish doesn't move. Uh, below the Petri dish is a camera. And that camera is going to follow the worm around. And the way it's able to follow the worm around is there's a motorized stage, two actuators, an X and a Y, that are going to guide it. And Along with this camera is going to move the lighting, which is attached to the same sort of platform here. And the computer is going to, oop, that's all I wanted. Here we go. The computer is going to follow this worm around. It's going to push the camera around so that here you can see the worm is always in view. And that way we get a high resolution video of the worm. This is an annotated video, um, and it's been automatically annotated. So this green dot you see here, yeah, marks the head of the worm. Overlaid on top of the worm is uh, the contour that I've extracted and the skeleton. So this is what my code is basically uh, trying to figure out what is warm and what is not. And you can see here that it's uh, demarked basically the or delineated, sorry, the uh, the contour and the skeleton of the worm. And the ventral side has been noted annotated by the experimenter, and here it is in the red dot. The ventral side is essentially um, where the worm lays eggs from. It's where its vulva is if it's a hermaphrodite. Uh, essentially, worms crawl on their left or their right side with their uh, belly on one side and their back on the other, and the belly is marked with a red dot. Move forward. Um, these videos, by the way, are on YouTube. So for every one of our experiments, you can look to see um, how faithful was my extraction of the particular worm. But if you're not convinced or you want to go uh, frame by frame, you're kind of interested in the exact measurements, we have a feature viewer, 
and that feature viewer allows you to load individual experiments. And you can go frame by frame within that feature viewer and understand what the measurement was uh, for a particular feature, let's say speed of the worm, right? So for example, if you're interested in the speed of the worm, you could go each frame and understand what the instantaneous speed of that worm was, see where it was on the plate, on that petri dish as it was crawling around uh, when we measured that speed, understand what the uh, skeleton looked like and the contour, and get a histogram of that feature overall. So you can understand the statistics for that particular worm of that feature. <coughs> there are 702 features. We'll go into them later on if we have time. Um, but I just want to give you an example of some of them. Some of them are simple and they're obvious, right? What's the size of the worm? So how long is it? How, how fat is it, right? Uh, depends along its body, so its posture, the speed, uh, the number of reversals when it was dwelling, just sitting there, the omega terms, which I had mentioned earlier, um, coiling, so when the worm touches itself, basically, forging movements at the head, the exploratory range of that worm as it goes around the plate and the curvature of its path. And we get into some really complex ones. Um, so I've really broken down the behavior of the worm to the, the smallest levels that I can at the moment, uh, which is basically things like the time between two individual omega terms, or the curvature of the tail on at its belly, sorry, on its belly side, at the ventral side, um, when it was reversing. Right? So we can really get into the details. And you'll see later on why it's important, actually, to break it down to this level of, of minutia to get a sense of, of what's different about it, particularly a mutated worm, relative to the, the control. So are you oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Uh, are you able to keep track of the body shape as it's doing an omega turn? At the moment, no. Um, so when the worm touches itself, uh, I don't skeletonize it. Um, it's a, a tricky problem, actually, to get it. Mm -hmm. And some people have somewhat solved it. I have an idea of how to solve it. Um, but at the time, we were pressed for, for time, basically. And so I, I never had a chance to, to complete it. So when the worm indeed touches itself, we lose information. And all we know is that likely that it's touching itself. Um, so yeah, so so the, the hardware itself is, is inexpensive, and I've tried to keep the cost down. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but essentially, it's under $5,000 to purchase the equipment and build one of these. The software, of course, is free. I've tried to make everything that I could free. You just saw an Omega turn take place. Um, we've recorded uh, all stages of life for a worm. And the equipment itself, sorry, the, the technology, or the worm tracker, has been used by over 20 labs worldwide. We try to make it kind of this it's a public thing in which people can use the tracker because there's a lot of demand for such a utility. Um, in our own lab, we purchased eight of these because they were cheap enough. Um, and we use them basically to take down the worms that we have put into the database, right? So the database is available at this web address, Worm Behavior, MRCA, LMB, CAM, ACUK. You can look it up. It's online. <coughs> and that is a public repository which has uh, over 300 strains of worms. So over 300 types of worms which basically have mutations within them that are different in some way or another from the uh, control. Um, it's represented by, uh, sorry, these 300 strains are represented by over 10,000 individual worms, experiments that were 15 minutes long, captured at uh, 30 frames per second. So, I mean, conceivably, if, you know, all worms acted the same of a certain type, you would only need one worm to differentiate your, what's different about this particular mutation than the wild type, but because you have a lot of behavioral variability. We take, in our case, 20 worms to represent a particular strain, and then 20, uh, about 60 individuals to represent the, the control, basically the wild type. And we compare this group versus the other group statistically. Um, and in collecting these worms, we have a thousand of the wild types, a thousand controls done over three years. So we can get a sense of what it even means to be wild type. We'll talk about that in a second. So what are the strains that we actually look at? We're looking at a broad variety of nervous system mutations, uh, mutations in, in nervous system signaling, in, uh, in musculature even, uh, so worms that are uncoordinated. For the most part, we're looking, we're trying to, we've chosen worms where we expect the behavior to be different because there is a ostensible change in the nervous system. Uh, we're looking at multiple alleles. So, you know, a gene, you can mutate a gene in multiple ways, right? You could screw it up entirely in such a way that it's entirely the protein product that it would code for is never made or is, is degraded so quickly that it's never used. Or you could make subtle changes into it. And that's what we call an allele. It's basically the same uh, 
a mutation in the same gene that leads to, uh, uh, sorry, different different forms of mutation within the same gene, and they might all knock it out, or all knock out the protein product, or they might um, change the protein products in various ways. Um, and we're looking at uh, also double and triple mutants, right? So you might have a mutation in one gene and a mutation in another gene, and you can breed these two ones together, and now you have mutations in two genes, and you can look to see how is it, you know, are, are, are the effects additive, or are they, are they, you know, are they kind of, uh, do they, what's the best way to say this, do they occlude one another? So essentially, you know, you've got one mutation that leads to a slow worm, and let's say a mutation that leads to a faster worm, and you combine these into a new worm. Is this new worm, you know, uh, just normal? Is it fast? Is it slow only? You can explore these possibilities, because the data set includes double and triple mutants. And the data itself is available in many formats, so you can, uh, like I stated before, you can find the overlay movies with the annotation on YouTube and go and look at your favorite mutant. Um, there are visual statistical summaries in a PDF format, and we'll get to those soon. And the raw data is available, so you can get the information for the statistics in Excel files, um, and you can even access uh, the full experiments in MATLAB, so you can see from one fraction of a second to the next what's actually happening with this one. So I want to convince you, first of all, that um, moving to a computerized quantification is more sensitive than human beings are, essentially. That we, that there's a reason we move to this, and the reason is, essentially, that there's only, there's a limit to how much we can do by eye, and if we kind of set a computer on the task, it can potentially do a lot better than ourselves in certain areas to get a, a more faithful reproduction of how this worm, how a particular mutation might be different than the wild type that's, that we've controlled, right? So one of those things is we are able to ask, um, how fast does a young adult grow, in this case of the wild type? Um, and this experiment was done with 25 young adults, um, where in which we recorded them over two hours. And if you look at this graph, you can see that there's a linear trend. There's a lot of noise, because if you just look at the length of a worm, well, worms contract, and they elongate, and there's a little bit of noise anyhow in the video. But if you look at this trend, you see a 1% growth for a young adult um, over per hour, essentially. So what that really translates to is, since the worm is only about a millimeter in size, and in width, it's about one-tenth of that size, um, you're looking at one one-hundredth of that uh, change in width, which essentially amounts to uh, one micron, which is difficult to see by eye, change per hour in the growth. We can uh, look at the crawling wave, right? So earlier I showed you this video, and we can go back to it just real quickly to take a look, of the worm crawling. And there's a wave-like pattern that follows along its body. That wave has an amplitude, which is the size of the bend in the worm, and how fast that wave propagates along that worm, which is essentially the frequency of that wave. And so if we look at that, um, this is once again 25 young adults, the same ones, and they were picked up from their plates where they were just chilling out on and resting and moved to a new plate on which they uh, are, are pretty agitated, right? You could imagine that if a giant hand came out of the sky and picked you up and moved you to a new location, you two might freak out for a good half hour, which is what they do, and the way you move is uh, is going to change as a result. So, that so would be pretty disturbing. Yeah, it would be pretty disturbing. I mean, you might, presumably half hour isn't even... Uh, isn't even enough for you to be like, hey, what's going on? Why did this giant hand pick me up out of the sky and move me to a new place? I was uh, just that might, that might take a few days to get over that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in this case, you can actually see a trend. So uh, on this graph, what you're seeing on the, uh, on the y-axis is either the frequency or, or the amplitude of the wave. So on the left is the frequency, um, and in the rightmost graph here is the amplitude of that wave. So essentially, how fast the wave propagates along the body and how big are the bends a long time, and you can see that within about a half hour, the frequency of that wave reaches some steady state here. Um, and so essentially the tau, the, the uh, let's not get into too many scientific terms, essentially within a half hour, the worm is habituated in terms of the frequency of the wave um, to its new environment, but the amplitude takes a much longer time period. So it's still, the bends are quite large until much further out um, in time when which the worm is finally kind of chilled out. And, and clearly, um, since these two uh, modalities that are present within it to create basically the movement of the worm have different um, habituation rates, 
they are likely governed by two different systems, right? Because otherwise they should chill out at the same rate. And similarly, we could look at the speed of the worm, right? So these two, um, uh, these two pieces of the crawling wave set the speed of the worm. And if you look at the speed of the worm, actually, its habituation rate, um, so the speed, once again, is on the y-axis, and the time is on the x-axis. The speed habituates within about a half hour. It looks very much like the habituation of the frequency of the wave. And you might guess that essentially the frequency of the wave, so the speed at which the wave propagates along the body, is setting the speed of the worm because they, they follow a similar um, habituation rate. I mean, it's just a, a hypothesis that you might form as a result of seeing this data. Um, so this is all in line with trying to convince you that essentially this method of looking at a worm with a computer uh, is, is better than what a human being can do. Um, and here we're looking at uh, three different worms. So on the left is a wild type worm that comes from the CGC. CGC is a central repository that issues out worms to people. A uh, long time ago our lab received our own wild type from them and they maintain their own wild type, the N2. So we reordered that and we decided to look at our lab strain versus the CTC strain. It's on the left here. Um, and this is just speed, right? And on at zero, the worm is paused. And on the right-hand side of this zero here, you can see this is forward speed. And on the left-hand side is the speed of the worm when it's reversing. And you can see that there's a high-speed modality for green, which is the CGC's wild type, relative to our own. So it tends to move faster on our own plates than our own worm. And you might guess that one of the reasons that might be the case is we've been raising our worms in our conditions. They've had a chance to kind of, uh, over time, adjust to it. The genetics, or at least we're, maybe we're choosing worms, who knows. For whatever reason, our own worms move much slower on plate, or sorry, move slower on plate than this uh, wild type from the CGC repository. And earlier I told you about this worm that did the, uh, performed a round trip uh, all the way from uh, Bristol, England, to Berkeley, and then back again. Uh, Originally, so we raise our worms on um, on petri dishes, but long ago, before anyone figured out how to do that, they were raised in a liquid culture. So it's a liquid media with food within it, um, and they were raised in that in that setting. And that worm that was raised in that setting was frozen down, and we obtained a copy of it. It's a potentially a, a an, oh sorry, it's an ancestrally related uh, wild type, and potentially uh, no. I don't think it's a direct relation, but it, it's long ago, you know, it's potentially the, the brother of the great, 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 sorry, not the brother because it's a map, right, but what have you, the sibling of the great, 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 great grandfather or grand hermaphrodite of our own worm. Um, and you can see that it, it extends an even higher speed modality here on the right, so it's even faster on our plates um, than our own worm. And one of the reasons that is, um, is known. So essentially there's a gene called NPR1. And in wild worms that you find uh, around the globe, and in this particular uh, frozen down worm that was revived for our purposes, um, that gene looks one way. And in, in, in our own wild types, um, it looks different. And the reason that we believe is that's the case is essentially because these worms are picked by hand and propagated from one plate to the next. And if you're picking worms off of a plate, and moving it to another plate, you're, you're inadvertently uh, producing a selection pressure, right? You want to choose a worm on its own because if the worm is hanging out with a bunch of other worms, it's going to be hard to just pick it up and move it to a new location. So you're going to keep choosing worms that like to be on their own, that, that don't display a social behavior. And in fact, that's what happened. This NPR1 variation basically leads to a worm that is in, in a non-social variant, that doesn't like to kind of aggregate together in, with a bunch of other worms in a clump. Um, but the worm you see here on the right here has the variant which, which makes it social. It does like to hang out in clumps, whereas ours doesn't. So here we're able to look at, at three different versions of the wild type. And it brings the question, what does it even mean to be a wild type? What does it mean to be the control, you know? So then, yeah, I, I, oh, to, I wanted to ask a question here as well. So, um, so essentially, I think one of the things that comes out of this, if, if, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, you might look at a worm in a dish in a, in a moment and try to identify if there's some difference between it and its brother, you know, in the same dish. With this technique, right, because you can look over such long periods of time, you can see patterns in movement and movement speed that you couldn't tell over the course of a minute or two, but 
that are much more obvious in, in longer time scales. Is that is that accurate? That is correct. Okay. And and in fact, one of one of the things that Andre is now looking at, uh, my colleague is on the paper, um, is essentially how long do you have to look at a worm to really get a sense of everything that it is that worm, right? You know, is it do you have to look at the whole lifetime of that worm or could you look at maybe 10 hours and you've seen it all, right? You've seen everything that worm, all its tricks. Um, and you could say, hey, I know everything about this worm. This is what this worm is like. So, so that's one of the things he's looking at. Um, and one of the things you can do with this system. Um, yeah, that, that's a good right. way to, to describe it. That's right. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is something that worm researchers tend to wonder, which is how many do, worms do I need for an experiment, right? I, I want to prove something statistically, and I get away with 10 worms, and I get away with 20 worms. In our case, we're using um, 20 worms for all our experiments to discriminate. Uh, I'm not going to get into statistics too much, but suffice it to say we're able to show that if, you know, if you're looking to see some minute difference, you understand that your worms are probably relatively wild type, but they show a slight change in speed. How many worms do you need to get at to achieve some statistical power and stay with, with that statistical power? Yet, yes, these two worms are very different because they... Um, because uh, you know the, we basically find that the two groups segregate this way when it comes to something like speed. I think that that otherwise, um, if I get into this territory too much, it might confuse everybody, including myself. <laughs> um, so okay, so so now hopefully that I've convinced you that we do have greater sensitivity using the computer. And just um, a time check, okay. just a time check. I would probably shoot for about another ten minutes, and so that we can then throw it open for questions. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, wait, okay. actually, oh, no, hang on. Okay, right. So we started the we started the half hour. I'm sorry. So no, you have more like uh, 30, 35, uh, 40 minutes. My, my mistake. Sorry. Please okay. Go. Okay, great, because uh, I was about to say we're not going to get to most of the results. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so let's, I'll move it along a little bit quicker, slightly. Um, although, you know, I try to keep it at a pace where people can understand it. So I just, hopefully I've convinced you that we do have that sensitivity that we need to ostensibly see big difference, or sorry, to, to notice the subtle differences between mutated worms and the controls. Um, and what do we actually use it for? Well, it turns out that, you know, 86% of the worm genome has already been uh, explored to some extent in screens, right? So they use this uh, technique in which they can interfere with individual uh, genes using this thing called RNA interference, which I won't go into. And they did a large-scale screen, and it turns out that, unfortunately, um, even when you do this, you don't notice much of an effect. So 85% of the worm uh, uh, genes have no ostensible phenotype when you look at them this way. So humans are not necessarily that great at distinguishing uh, subtle differences, or maybe the worms don't even show a difference, right? But uh, a recent study actually showed that, in fact, um, any time you tend to knock down, you, you interfere with worm genetics, you have a worm that is outbred by the wild type, which essentially means that the wild type worm the normal worm is more fit and, and survives better in conditions and will outbreed any worm where you mess with its genetics. Um, and so essentially, the there's probably... Oh, sorry. In the lab environment, right? In the lab environment, exactly. Um, and so there's this phenotyping gap. There's essentially something going on, but we just can't point to what it is that's making these, these worms where we messed with their genes unfit um, relative to their wild-type controls. So, uh, in our case, we're looking at 300 uh, nervous system-related uh, mutations, 300 strains, and we actually find significant differences for all of them. So hopefully we've narrowed down the phenotyping gap. Among them are 76 genes which had no previous phenotype, even though they had been screened, or many of them had been screened and looked at in individual experiments, and we find significant differences for all of them from the wild type. And I'll talk about just a few of them, because 76 is far too many to get into. Um, one of those is TRIP-A2. It's uh, hypothesized to be a mechanosensory mutant, which essentially means that when they're touched, sorry, or their own ability to discriminate uh, uh, mechanical changes in their body deformation, so to speak, um, is likely to be altered from the wild type, right? Um, this TRIP-A2 was looked at, but there was no particular phenotype. But when we look at it here, we are, we're looking at three alleles, and they're all knockouts, so these are three uh, strains of worm where in which trip A2, that this particular gene was knocked out in different ways. Uh, two come from, one comes from the American Knockout Consortium and two come from the Japanese. 
Um, on the left, in more vivid colors, is uh, the set of worms that essentially have the gene mutation. And on the right are the wild type controls. And you can see here that the number of bends, which is on the y-axis, uh, is greater for these particular trip A2 gene mutants than the, it is for the controls, only when they're reversing. Or I'm showing you only when they're reversing. Uh, and essentially, so this is a subtle change. You know, there's just slightly a little bit more bend in that body when the worm reverses. And you can tell why it might be difficult for a human to see this, because the worm just doesn't reverse that often. And you would have to note that it looks slightly different just when it reverses. So that gives you a sense of what we're able to, kind of how we're able to ascribe a phenotype. And that's directly in line with this, um, this mechanosensation hypothesis, which was generated just because the gene looks like other mechanosensory genes. This is TRIP2. It actually had a phenotype for, I believe, nicotine, um, if I remember correctly. Um, but basically, it had no locomotion phenotype, right? So no one had ever observed just this regular worm when it moves on plate being different than, a, uh, than its controls. Um, and in fact, we actually uh, are able to describe two phenotypes of that. This is not part of the 76 genes, which had no previous phenotype. This is just to convince you that even genes that had a phenotype, um, we're able to dis discover more uh, sorry, a little bit more detail for that particular phenotype. In this case, these worms essentially uh, move their head faster when they're reversing, and they uh, perform less omega turns than the wild type. And then finally, OCR4, which is also hypothesized, I think, to be a mechanosensory mutant based off of its uh, 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 genetics. And I'm not entirely sure. I might be misspeaking here. But it had no, as far as I remember, it has no previous phenotype and essentially we find that there's some, um, a little bit more tail motion when it's paused, and its crawling amplitude is less so than the lot type. So just to give you a sense of some of the stuff we're able to pull out um, and understand, you know, now we have 76 genes, which we have a better understanding of what they're likely to do, and we can form hypotheses and start to really explore um, uh, the genetic pathway involved. What do you mean tail motion when they're paused? Do they whack their tail, or...? Um, it, essentially, any type of... Uh, tail motion when it's paused. So it might actually be, a, it might have to do with defecation, right? The worms tend to defecate uh, when they're paused. Um, so it might essentially be that the tail contracts. Maybe there's a greater contraction when it defecates. Or maybe they just don't sit still that much. You know, they're even though they're just kind of sitting there, they're still a little bit antsy. I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. You know, you, this is the thing where you'd have to go back to the video to really understand as a human being what it was, you know, and quantify it in that sense. So it, to some extent, it points to it, and then you go back and take a look. But what it means, I would have to break it down even further. Um, in this case, it's essentially the arc. So it's the angular. It's the angle which the tail. Sorry, the angle which the tail is is is, um, is circumscribing when it's paused is greater. So it just has a greater angular speed when paused. Um, okay. So now that we, we start to understand what these actually these mutants look like, um, we want to ask this question, right? I, I've got a bunch of mutants, and I, I know what they look like. And, and since I know what some of these mutants actually do, I know what the genetics are involved in, can I then predict genetic relationships from how the worms look like, right? So what I'm going to do is called the clustering. And I'm going to cluster the uh, mutant worms based off of how they act, right? And I'm going to say, hey, do these clusters bring together worms um, in such a way in which I can make predictions about, you know, which genes might interact, which two proteins, you know, one protein activates another or they form a complex together, um, you know, which ones are likely to do this, right? So I took our 305 strains, basically, and I clustered them. won't go too much into how that's done. Um, and just as a control, it turns out that the wild types do come together in a nice tight cluster, right? So I'm taking the wild types and I'm grouping them by hour, by day and by month. So everything that was done on Tuesday goes together in one group. Everything that was done at 11 a.m. goes into another group. And, and everything that was done in September, let's say, goes into another group. And, you know, of course, these guys should come together. They're all wild types. They should all behave relatively similar. And it's just a control to show you that it's, you know, the clusters do come together as you would expect. Similarly, um, the wild isolates come together. So these are worms where we know they have this NPR1 variant that I spoke about earlier, um, and worms from uh, all the way from, sorry, these are wild worms that were, were found in a given location. So they were found in Altadena, 
and in South Africa and in Hawaii and in Scotland, they all come together. And it's known, actually, that they have this NPR1 variant and another thing called the Globin 5 variant, which is a variant for sensing oxygen because the oxygen in soil is different. You would expect them to come together, and indeed they do. And interestingly enough, there are several genes. So this RC301 is from Germany. CB4856 is from Hawaii. And the LSJ1 I spoke to you about earlier, it's the one that comes from Bristol and is frozen down. Um, and this is NPR1, so this is the actual gene right here that came together in this cluster. There's three other genes that we don't know very much about, NPR3, GPA16, and NLP17, which we haven't explored, and I'll talk to you about them in a second, which also come together in this cluster. And you might guess that because these worms tend to behave similarly, the wild isolates in the NPR1 variant, that maybe they too somehow interact with NPR1, or maybe they're variant in the wild types. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Finally, just to give you a, a sense that the clustering is indeed um, good potentially at predictions, these are a bunch of published pathways that came together with uh, statistical significance in this clustering. So these are a bunch of things that papers were published about where we know that there's an interaction between the two genes, two mutated genes, and so indeed we would expect the phenotypes to look similar, that these two would behave similarly and that they should come together. So. Hopefully this convinces you that the clustering is, to some extent, potentially a, a good tool to make predictions. And here's the prediction that it made, or the one that one of the ones that we can look at. At the bottom left here are all the are three wild isolates, so the LSJ1, which came from Bristol, the Hawaiian strain, um, the one from Germany, and an NPR1, so a, a wild type worm where in which just the NPR1 gene was mutated. Right? On the left, in each one of these pictures, is the mutant strain, and on the right is the wild type controls that it was the wild type that it was controlled against. There are about 24 worms in the left picture and 24 worms in the right picture represented, and this is their path on the plate. So this is what they were doing on the petri dish, and the heat map that you see is a color representing how fast that worm was. Right. So if it's moving very fast forward, it's in red, and if it's moving very fast backward, it's in blue, and you can see that in these four, which share this NPR1 variant, they all move very fast. And in the case of the Hawaiian strain, and a little bit in the other strains, it tends to leave its food. It's got some exploratory nature to it. And you can see why these three genes that we're uh, particularly interested in might have come together. And it's because in the case of NPR3, it's very fast moving on plate. It tends to also leave the food. Uh, similarly for GPA16, it also moves quite fit fast and also tends to leave its food. And it looks like NLP17 leaves its food a little bit too. This is um, potentially why they're predicted to come together, although this is something that that the features only represent by proxy. So the fact that we see this also on plate is, is somewhat indicative that indeed it's it's likely that their behavior is even similar beyond what the tracker, sorry, what the analysis would have shown. And we're looking into these now. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think we have enough time, so we'll get into this. I want to show you how we actually use the data, how a researcher might use this data that we have online, right? We have these very nice PDF visual summaries. And let's say I'm a postdoc, and I want to, uh, I'm daydreaming of visiting Hawaii to ostensibly collect some worms, just like this Hawaiian strain came from. So I, I want to propose a grant where I go to Hawaii and pick up some worms, maybe on the beach. I don't know where they come from here. We find them in rotting fruit, so maybe just off in this green part here, I could find some nice ones. Um, so I might go basically to our database and wonder what's different about the Hawaiian string. I'm going to go specifically and pull down that PDF file. And on the first page, I can already see what the phenotype is of that worm, right? So I've got this phenotypic ontology, which breaks down into what was different about the body, the posture of the worm, its motion, and its path. And the only things you see here are things that were statistically significant, right? So in this case, in blue with the minus sign, the length and the width of the Hawaiian worm are statistically uh, significantly different, or they're smaller than their wild type controls. Um, you can see here in terms of motion, they move a lot more. They pause a lot less. And uh, things that are greater than have a plus and are, are marked in magenta. For those who are colorblind, there's the plus and the minuses. And then things that are just different, where we couldn't ostensibly say what's different about them, they're marked with this delta sign to say that they're different. Let's say I'm curious about foraging because it's different. But I wonder, what, how is it different? Well, here I go to page 52. This is a very long PDF file with a lot of details. So you can really get into the nitty-gritty of what's going on. 
And I can see in the histogram itself, um, in magenta here, in the forefront, is the Hawaiian, uh, the foraging amplitude, basically. So what its head was doing, the bends of its head to the belly side and the other side, to its back and its belly on either side. And I can see that its bends are more constrained, essentially. In, in gray here, in the background, the histogram is the wild type control, and I can see that the histogram is more constrained. Essentially, it does not like to bend its head as much, or maybe it's constrained and it can't bend its head as much as a wild type control. Um, and I can find all the statistics up here, too, in this kind of header. I can find out how many worms were used for the study, how many samples there were, um, and then I can actually get the, the mean and the standard uh, standard error of the mean, too, for the... Uh, on the left-hand side for the uh, for the mutant strain, and on the in brackets here for the control, I can see what the statistics were. So I can see the p-value and the q-value. For those who know statistics, the q-value corrects against multiple testing. So I'm doing I got 702 features. I do a lot of statistical tests, and I need to correct for that because normal probability is just for one test. When you do a million tests, you're probably going to find something different unless you correct for that situation where you're now looking at. At these number of tests. And, uh, I won't go further into that because that gets into uh, some nasty statistics. Let me ask and, you a question, though. Let me ask you a sure. question. Um, uh, just on, on, on the 702 features. So have you, do you think it would be possible or have you calculated what is the probability that two worms that have exactly the same profile across all 702 of your features are like a different worm or the same worm, you know, like is it, is it like in order to, for them to match across all features, it's like, you know, 99.9999% chance that they have the same genotype, uh, that they, that they're actually the same individual, uh, well, times, like, like how do you think about that? So, so I think the two ways that I like to think about it is the fact that in the clustering, all the controls came together. Um, which means that to be a wild type worm on Wednesday means that you're not, or at 11 a.m., even though we know that you're slightly different than, you, than at, let's say, uh, 5 p.m., and I can show you some data for that, that even though you're different like that, you're not different enough relative to the population of mutants to actually make that a big enough difference. But I think a good way to look at it, let me show you two things that, that really get at the heart of your question, which are, um, first and foremost, here we go. How tight is your overlap, right? So the N2s are trivial. You know, if you look at one control versus the next, you'll see a worm which looks relatively the same, right? But, you know, let's say we've got a mutant, and, and all that mutant is that's different about that mutant is that, in this case, it's just a little bit shorter than normal. What would we see in these histograms, right? Um, and here is a set of histograms that correspond to it. In color are the ones that correspond to the C11D... 2.2. <laughs> it, it's got that name because nobody has any idea what it does yet, and so it hasn't been assigned a real name. It's just assigned to where it's located on the genome. And you can see that the overlap is really tight, actually, for these histograms. Most of them, most of the histograms lie right on top of each other. And the only ones that are different are the length here. So you can see that the length, this guy's shorter, and it's thinner. Uh, sorry, not that's the track length. That's not thinner. It just takes on... Uh, the track length is, is likely altered by the size of the worm itself, so let's not discuss it. But suffice it to say that most of the histograms lie directly on top of each other. So we do notice subtle differences, and, you know, when worms aren't that different from the wild type, they tend to look wild type, you know, as you can see here, and, and just show up where you would expect them to be different. Um, and we do know there are changes among wild type, and so even though they came together in that beautiful cluster, let me show you this, this is looking at worms. Uh, this is just the wild types, broken down by hour, day, and month. So if you break down the worm, the wild types into groups uh, by day, you know you just don't see much of a difference. Every day, it doesn't matter if you record worms on on Tuesday or Thursday, it's still the same worm, you know. Um, but on the other hand, the months are are significant because we're working in a, a building that's old and and the air conditioning isn't on in the, at night time, and and so the worms grow up a little bit different. And you can see that they grow up at different rates. So they're faster in certain months than they are at other times. Um, and similarly, by hour of the day, too, you see these differences, and they're significant. And meaning, basically, that, you know, we picked these worms the night before, 
at a very specific stage, their L4 stage, and as the day progresses, they're slightly older, and, and they do behave differently. So the, f the fact is that when you look at them in terms of just statistics, you can see the difference, but when you look at them in terms of behavior, um, aggregating them into clusters, the difference is so subtle that, you know, if you're looking at them relative to mutant worms, they mostly look the same relative to those mutant ones. So it's, it's, I guess it's a matter of, of the scale you're looking at, right? If you're looking at a very small scale, you can see the differences, but if you're looking at a large scale at, at this mutant population, uh, identical worms look identical. Cool. Uh, and just to ask that question another way, um, maybe I missed it in the paper. Do you uh, summarize how many uh, worms were not different from the wild type in any way, or is every worm different from the wild type? Um, every so every mutant, every strain was marked significantly different than the wild type with one or more features. So there was at least one distinguishing feature for these mutants relative to the wild type in, in, in terms of their groups. Um, relative to the wild type as a popula as a, as a whole, not as a whole, sorry, as, as relative to the wild type controls, right? So the best way to think about this is we're recording these mutant strains at the same time as a bunch of controls, right? So we've got 20, you know, of the ones with the mutation and let's say 60 of the ones without it, right? And then we kind of take that group and we say, okay, within the group, there's some set of variability. So is there any difference between these two groups above and beyond the variability that you have within the groups themselves using statistical tests? And it turns out that, you know, you, you basically you do a, a many tests. You're doing 702 different tests. And then you control for the fact that you did multiple tests. And for all of these worms, you find at least one difference or more that distinguished them. And you would expect this to some extent because we chose nervous system mutations. Right? or hypothesized nervous system mutations. So we expect that there should be, if you mess with the nervous system, there should be some definitive output as a result. Does that make sense? Sorry, I, I don't, I, I'm hoping I, I get it across, but yeah, it's a, it's a statistical argument, um, and, and those things kind of get tricky in and of themselves. L let me know if I, should I proceed? Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That, that's okay. great. Thank you. Okay, definitely, definitely. Um, let me go back to where were we? Ah, okay, okay. I want to be here and here. Uh oh. Okay. Right, to the right. Okay, yeah. So now that I, I kinda looked at the forging, I'm also interested in just how these other there are a whole bunch of other measures here, right? The velocity and and the number of turns and the coiling that took place, and the range of the path. So I want to look at that, and I can bring up in my PDF a, a, a worm on a virtual plate, 24 of them, right? And, and like we saw in the earlier figures, on the left here is the mutant, and on the right here is the control, and I can look at its speed on plate and where it performed the uh, omega turns, marked by an X, and where the coils were perform, performed, marked by this plus sign, and and see that, in fact, this Hawaiian likes to leave its food, and the Hawaiian worm likes to leave its food. It moves a lot faster. And, you know, where it likes to perform its, um, its omega turns. Uh, so going forward. And then at the very end, one of the reasons why this PDF is so long is you can find all the methods. So how exactly did we do all this? I hope I've gone into enough detail in these last 20 pages of that PDF so that any time someone has a question like, how, I just don't believe this, how did he do this? You can go back and see. You can read for yourself. I have a good um, question. Oh, sure. Uh, so on food, did you track just one worm, worm at a time? Yeah, it's always a single worm. And uh, out of curiosity, did you keep track of how far they left when they left the food patch? Um, you can own... So we don't know where the food patch is in, mm -hmm. in, in the old version of the tracker. I'm rebuilding it now so that you can actually know where the food patch is. We basically... This is a trick of of knowing where the worm started out roughly and, and then centering it all, that we, we get this view on the virtual plate of where the food was likely at. But truth be told, this is just a proxy of it, it's, and, and potentially not a very good one. Um, although it looks like it is a pretty good one, because the food, if I show you what the pictures of the food look like, they look like that little circle right there. Yeah. Um, okay, so...
So I'm not going to get too much into this one. I wanted to say that the spreadsheet data can be used as well, right? So we have the, the details in, in spreadsheet form. You can open it up in Excel and what have you. And this is a particular mutant. Uh, just got named degenerate link to mechanosensation. So it's a mechanosensory mutant. Once again, it, it, it's hypothesized to because of the, the, the particular gene and what it looks like in terms of other genes, it looks like a mutant that basically has some some issue when it's sensing its own body, its proprioception, so to speak. Um, and here you can see in this histogram of its mid-body bends, I'm not going to get too, into too much detail, that the wild type, which is in gray, has an asymmetry um, on its ventral side versus its dorsal side. And that's something that someone brought home to me and said, look, the worm is crawling on its left or right side, and worms don't like to do back bends. You know, it's got a bulb on one side on its belly, and it's lays eggs out of it, and if it back bends a little bit too much, maybe it spit a bunch of eggs out, you know? Not a comfortable position to be in anyhow to, to really break your back moving backwards. And so we see this asymmetry in a normal worm. Um, and that symmetry is broken, actually, in this, uh, sorry, this asymmetry is broken. The symmetry is restored in this uh, hypothesized mechanosensory mutant. You could come up with an hypothesis that might say that, look, the worm, in order to not do back bends, maybe the worm has to sense that, and potentially this a uh, particular gene, the protein product, right, the protein product that's coded for by it, is involved in regulating the worm so that it doesn't do that because it might cause structural damage. It might have some adverse effect to it. Um, so you can go to that particular data set and then do the statistical tests and see, you know, is that um, null hypothesis true? Is it the fact that these two worms um, bend the same way or do they bend differently? Now it turns out there's not enough data in the spreadsheet in this particular case to statistically prove it, and you would have to go to the actual um, raw files, to so the, the MATLAB files, which are in this next part here, um, and really get into the nitty-gritty of the data, right? And, and I wanted to show, this is something I did for a particular conference, I did on the plane ride over, um, it's defecation. I'll talk to you about defecation right now. Um, and I just want this video to play here. So this is a worm defecating. This is only video of it defecating. Defecation looks like this. It's going to squeeze its uh, tail to push up the fluid in its gut all the way up to its head, or not up to its head, but forward to its anterior portion, and then it's going to squeeze its head to push the fluid out of its anus, essentially. So you can see here the tail squeeze and then the, followed by the head squeeze in these videos. And these videos actually uh, are pulled out, sorry, these, these sections of video are pulled out of, of normal video using this algorithm I built. I'll get into the details of it. So this is defecation. Defecation motor program happens at regular intervals of 45 seconds. There's something called the posterior body contraction, which is called PBOC for short. Essentially, the tail is squeezed. Um, then there's a relaxation step. And then there's the anterior body contraction, where in which the head is squeezed. And then an expulsion step that follows, in which all that fluid defecation is released through the one's anus. Um, it was uh, published in 1994 by Lewin Thomas, the exact details of it. Um, and what it looks like, if you pull up our features, we don't, you know, in the original data set and in the paper, we certainly don't quantify defecation. Although I always believed it would be easy to do. Because here you can see the traces of the worm's length directly. Wait, why can I not? Okay, let me go back. You can see traces of the worm's length right here in this graph, and you can see two contractions, right? So this is the worm's length. It goes, there's arbitrary units here, and it squeezes about every 45 seconds, which is essentially its defecation pattern. And when it squeezes, you can see the posterior body contraction as an increase in the width of the tail. You know, if you pull your head in, your neck's going to get larger, and if a worm pulls in its head or its tail, that part is going to get wider as a result. And with a simple algorithm where I'm just matching peaks, I'm just looking for a posterior body contraction, which is coupled to a length contraction, so a fatness, an increase in the fatness at the tail with, alongside a length contraction, and then an increase in the width of the head followed by a uh, length contraction. I'm going to call that a defecation step, and it turns out that if I do that, I pick up the defecation pretty accurately, in fact. So I, um, I essentially only have about 1% false positive and 7% false negative. And if you do this work, you know how painstaking it is because you have to watch a worm under a microscope continuously for about a half hour just to get 50 events in, and that's for one worm. Um, 
And with that data, I can even go further and see where does a worm like to poop on its virtual plate, these little red dots here along its path. So, so uh, oh, just sure. if folks are, folks are watching and um, sort of thinking this discussion is, is perhaps a bit perverse, huh. you sort of like zoom out one, one level of, uh, you know, one level from the biology and sort of say like, why is having uh, you know this level of data valuable? Um, you know what is it? Uh, wh what is it about this example that shows the the power of this system? Oh, okay, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, in understanding the brain, the brain is this giant human brain, right? Is 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 about a trillion cells, and then there's about you know a thousand connections between a, a thousand more connections than that in between these individual neurons. And you kind of wonder, you know, I mean, it, it appears that our brain is built from smaller units. And right? you want to understand how do these smaller units bring about behavior, right? What does a small unit actually do? And it turns out that in other organisms, we understand that some of the small units are uh, central pattern generators, right? They generate a repeated pattern um, that then instructs things like your walking, right? So how do you walk with regular movements? It's a central pattern generator in your spinal cord. And in this case, Defecation motor program is in itself, itself a regular pattern that is constructed from neurons. I don't know enough about it, so I might be speaking wrong here, but uh, this, is, they're definitely, this is a regular motor program that's activated, and by understanding the circuitry which activates it, you can then understand how other small circuits might bring about repetitive behaviors, right? Um, and, right. Uh, yeah, that, and, so so oh, just sorry. to draw the contrast, if I have it correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you were showing us before is that you can use the system to basically see where the uh, where the worm goes and how fast it goes around the plate and kind of like at a you know from an aerial view. And this now shows you that you actually have the ability to um, to see how the worm is behaving at a finer grain in terms of uh, some some activities that it's doing that sort of uh, at the level of just its own body, which exactly. is uh, in more detail. And lets you get at a different level of uh, circuitry uh, questions. Is that do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Another thing you can look at is clearly there's a clock involved in this, right? To beat at 45 seconds regularly, you need some sort of clock-like mechanism. Um, and I believe that's done through neuropeptides. And I believe the neuropeptide that does it actually has a human equivalent, right? And a lot of pathways are actually conserved all the way. Uh, from these lower level organisms to much higher level organisms. It turns out that uh, the path, the stress pathway in the worm is definitely conserved all the way to humans. So understanding how these genes work in an intractable organism like C. elegans, right, means oftentimes that you can translate that work to humans. And that gives you a better sense of, you know, you're seeing some sort of mutant gene, let's say, in, in Alzheimer's disease, right? Or sorry, let's say, let's take something that's actually rather recent and relevant, which is uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, right, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Well, it turns out that worms have an equivalent gene to the ones that we find mutated in certain forms of ALS. And while you can't do these experiments in human, it would be horrendous, frankly, um, you can't do these experiments in worms. You can say, hey, what is, this, what, is the, what is the cell biology pathway for this? And in fact, if things operate at the cell biology pathway, then they definitely have a uh, fixes in human beings. So you, sorry, the fixes that you can translate to human beings. So if you understand what's going wrong at a cell biology level in a worm, and you can find a medication that might ease that, that medication might well translate to be used in, in, in human beings if it doesn't cause toxic effects, and there are other, some other interruptions along the pathway. But, but you definitely can understand how a regulatory pathway of proteins is destroyed by mutant gene, and how you might restore it to health. That's a good way to put it. Got it. That's great. You know what's going on with the pooping patch down there? Pooping patch. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It it found a little place where it uh it liked to just chill out and poop. <laughs> Is that common? Just out of curiosity. Um, you know, I haven't looked at enough of these. Uh, I did it for the conference because I thought it was cool, and and then I uh, got back to um the lab, and Oliver said, uh, you know, I was working on the paper just to get a few more things done. Um, uh. uh for the editors, and then as soon as the paper was done, I thought I would rest a little bit and do some more fun stuff. Oliver said, uh, okay, now that the paper's done, you can get to some real work, huh? <laughs> so, yeah, it never ends, basically. I would love to look at this. Um, I, I think that other people 
who do this type of work are really excited about this because it is really a nightmare. I know a girl who, who did it for her entire PhD and she was like, is this done yet? Because I, I can really use it. I, you know, I never want to do this work again. So, so yeah, watching a worm poop under a microscope for half an hour is, is no fun for, for anybody. Or may, well, maybe there's a random person out there who likes it. Um, you know, there's, the world takes all kinds. <laughs> all right, so we're um, we're about 20 minutes from the end time. This time, I think I have it right. Okay, um, great. I can, uh, you know what? I can I can wrap it up now, or because uh, the questions might sur questions might surface as to how some of the stuff was done, and, and I have slides for that, and that might actually eat up a lot of time too. Okay. Um, so let's let's let me just kind of wrap it up a little bit, just to give you a sense of what I've shown. Um, I showed you the system, which is the Worm Tracker 2.0. It's an automated system uh, to precisely quantify phenotypes. So it's a computerized system where we get a real sense of what a worm does, how it behaves, what it looks like. Um, there's a broad set of 702 features that are measured for a worm. It's got high resolution and sensitivity, and it's been used by uh, over 20 labs worldwide, and hopefully a lot more now that the paper's coming out. Um, most of these people found out about it just through conferences before. Um, and we have this public database of uh, phenotypes, of what particular mutations look like in worms. You know, we've got 300 strains which have uh, nervous system mutations. Um, 10,000 single worm experiments, so 10,000 of these videos you've seen. You can imagine the work that went into collecting those. And that's Laura Grundy's work. And I'll, I'll say everybody who was involved in second. Um, there were 76 mutants which had no previously described phenotype, so we didn't understand what those genes did at all. Because it didn't look like they did anything, and, and we now understand at least something which is different about worms that have that uh, particular uh, genetic mutation. Um, we've got a wild type reference, so you know this question of, hey, what is, what is a control? What does a control even do? What is a real worm? What's a normal worm? We're able to answer that with about 1,000 uh, worms that were collected over three years which ha should have virtually identical genetics because the rate of mutation in a worm uh, is about 10 to the negative 8 per generation per site on the genome. Um, and we have the phenotypic changes, so the differences between related wild types. And all the details are now available in the, this Nature Methods paper. Um, and then, because we don't have, <laughs> we'll get to all that stuff in a second. This is, you know, me pipe dreaming that I could actually show all this. Um, <laughs> But uh, these are the people who were involved. So uh, Laura Grundy uh, was on the left here. She painstakingly put worms under on my hardware for three years. Um, and I mean, I can't even tell you how in indebted I am to her and, and everybody to some extent. That's certainly, you know, a 20, that's a, an eight hour, 10 hour a day task, five days a week. Um, Tadas helped out with the nice GUI that you've seen if you've used the uh, not the uh, tracking software, because I built the GUI for that, but the analysis software, he built the nice kind of framework on top of that, and uh, also the, the website that you've seen um, to organize the data uh, that I've produced. Um, he built that very nice website and a pipeline, um, which we run in the lab to kind of automate stuff. Um, Andre Brown has had his hand in everything. He's really been my mentor for this work. Uh, I, he managed this project in its later, latter half and really got everything done and really had a focus and a view of where it should go. Uh, Bill's run the whole show. Um, and uh, I'd like to give some special thanks to Chris Cronin and Paul Sternberg who gave us some of their code for features. Um, specifically, well, not ones I think that you've seen, but, but uh, wavelength and track length and, and some issues of amplitude, not the ones that I've shown them. Um, and a great big thank you to the CGC. I, I recently saw um, who was involved in, I think it's like four or five people who send out worms all over the world. They send out God knows how many worms to people. It's amazing that an operation like that, which I thought was at least 100 people involved in, is, is only about five. So they're incredible. Um, yeah, so let's get to questions, I guess. Or I could keep going, but uh, maybe it's a good time to stop for questions. What, what are your thoughts? Sorry. Who's got questions? So how long have you tracked an individual worm for? Oh, okay. that, that is a great question. Um, we have tracked worms for uh, 10 hours uh, continuously. And uh, right now, I've, I've rebuilt the system so that we can track worms for much longer. Uh, we're hoping to get, essentially, 
Um, I mean, we were able to get the entire life of a worm, and, and we hope to put that online soon enough as well. I'm really interested in the uh, what you brought up the uh, the notion of a central pattern generator that kind of uh, you know organizes a particular behavior in time uh, and. Uh, you kind of had that example of defecation. I wonder how much information you, well, you have all the information, but how much have you done to kind of look at the temporal ordering of the different types of behaviors that could be doing um, and to work on maybe automating that in some way? So, okay, so first I should start out saying that I'm not sure if, if the defecatory motor program is in fact ruled by central pattern generator. Sure. It's not, I, feel I should not have said it. An, well, that's an empirical <laughs> question that you can actually go, go ahead and ask now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, um, if you don't have a slide to, to, to speak of, right, maybe you should just uh, stop stop sharing your screen so we can see you. Um, oh, sure. Okay, definitely. Um, okay, let me. How do I? I go out of screen share. Go back and hit the uh, yeah. capture. Button. Right, capture. No, no, it's the uh, it's the screen share. Just hit the screen share button again. Okay, I did it. Oh, okay, great. Okay, Long fantastic. Time. Okay, so so actually, this is one of the questions that Andre is addressing right now. So he. He came out with this beautiful paper um, off of the data set, actually earlier than this Nature Methods paper, and you can find it in PNAS, where he talks about behavioral motifs. So what he's looking for is creating basically a, a language of worm behavior, right? So if you take a worm and, and then you start to codify its behaviors, you break them down into words, so to speak, right? So the worm moving, let's say, this way is one word, and, and maybe doing something else is another word. And then you can ask, uh, is there some ordering? present, you know, to these words. And, and that's one of the things he's looking at now, basically, which addresses your question, how many things really in a worm's life are ruled by a definitive pattern? Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the early uh, ethnologists, neuroethologists, neuroethologists, I can never, not ethnologists, because that's a different word, neuroethologists. <laughs> ethologists. <laughs> yeah, ethologists. Um, they, uh, they looked at these things called fixed action, fixed action patterns, right? Can you elicit a particular behavior from a worm Sorry, not from a worm, from an animal, um, you know, given some sort of stimuli, and and this is one of the things Andre is addressing. You know, how much, how much freedom do we really have to some extent, right? Are we just doing smaller actions repetitively over and over again, or or do we have some sort of, you know, does an organism have some sort of freedom in how it orchestrates its its behaviors? You know, are we purely responsive to stimuli, and in a way, in such that that we always have some fixed action? sets that, that are the response, you know? Or, or can we quantify some variability? Can we say, yes, this is fixed, but this part is variable to some extent, you know? The worm must reverse, but, you know, within how it reverses, it has some freedom to reverse and then take a turn or, or, or what have you. Sure. So, like, for example, you could, uh, maybe using your system now, set up different experimental questions for your different strains, say, put them on a gradient of a particular chemical or something, and see if they all act in the same way relative to the, the, the particular stimulus that you're using or something like that. Using exactly. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, exciting. there was a, a beautiful paper that, um, that I think it's uh, William Ruiz's group, and I think it might have been Greg Stevens came out with recently, where they look at uh, a thermotactic response, mm -hmm. um, and they actually are looking in uh, this, you know, uh, it's, it's this uh, mathematical uh, dynamic, you know, I can't even, I'm not going to get into it because I will show my ignorance. But essentially, uh, if you look in a particular space, you can see that, that the worm has a fixed set of, of behaviors to some extent that, it, that form an attractor in the space sure. and, and, and that govern, essentially, its response to heat. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, once again, that's not my work, and I'm not sufficiently familiar enough to talk about it with any form of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, get, getting back to Adam's question, uh, just to understand the database, is it correct that most of the data that's currently on there is data from 30 minutes uh, post-movement? Uh, and if that's the case, do you have any intention of starting to include data of that movement itself uh, so people could look at uh, that return to baseline? Um, and, sure. and just other sort of manipulations that you could possibly do that are, are non-standard, if you could comment on those non-standard preparations if you have plans to put that on the database as well. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, so for the purposes of quantifying mutants versus controls, we follow a very strict um, 
mm -hmm. regimen to some extent. As much as we can control for, right? The worms are raised in the exact same environment. They're uh, they're essentially on the, on very similar plates. As much as we can control them. And the night before and we record them, we're choosing them at a very specific stage, the L4 stage, which I think at the temperature at which looking we're looking at is about 10 hours. So there's a 10 hour kind of you know older, younger worm. But real in the reality of it is not even that much of a difference because in fact um, they look very they have a very specific look right around the central time period of that stage. Um, and then we we essentially we put them down on a plate, give them 30 minutes to chill out and then we record them for 15 minutes, right? And that way we're hoping that they're fairly standard across the, the population when we... When we and the question is, you know, are we looking at them at any time period that's not that? Um, and the answer is, there, the 25 experiments that were done with young adults for two hours were in which there was no 30-minute habituation. I think they're online as far as I understand. Um, but I don't know if they're separated in a particular way, um, but I, I should double-check that. Um, I no longer own the project um, because I'm not in the lab. Um, so that is, is I understand that there are plans to do that, and that's one of the reasons I want to involve OpenWorm. Um, but there's a large data set that should be put online um, that is, is not accessible, partially because some of it is private data and partially because it was not directly part of the paper. Um, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be made available, especially as people publish some of it. Um, and so there is that goal, essentially, to, to, to make it a, a available. Uh, beyond that, you know, as soon as the paper comes out about um, the, uh, essentially, the, the longer views of warm life, um, then what I hope to do is essentially put online the, the, these long, long experiments where in which you can look at a worm at any stage of its life, start to understand how it develops, and, and really get a sense of that type of, uh, of information. Uh, Someone else can go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I wondered if you could just um, zoom out again a little bit and um, speak to um, how detailed this um, ability to capture the, de the specifics of behavior is compared to what is possible to collect in higher order uh, model organisms or other, other species, and uh, the extent to which we now know more about uh, the behavior of, of C. elegans as compared to something more complex. Any comparable kinds of behavioral um, capture projects that you've seen, maybe in Drosophila or maybe mice or sure. humans? That that's so. A, a lot of this work, actually, in terms of, of quantifying behavior through computers, is relatively recent. Strangely enough, in worm, it dates back to. Uh, the mid 1980s, and uh, I only discovered it when I was doing my thesis. I came across uh, uh, Dave Dusenberry, I think is how I pronounce the name, um, and I was amazed to see he had a multi-worm tracker in 1985, uh, in which you can look at multiple worms and, and, and their behavior, but just as dots. And uh, I mean, I wrote to him to tell him how amazed I was by it. And my friend even asked me, you know, did this guy travel back in time with the technology? It's unbelievable. Um, but so Worm has actually had a long kind of uh, grace period of, of trying to collect this information, but no one has gone to high levels of detail till recently, and I, I don't entirely know why. It's partially limited by the technology. Only recently can we really store this much data on computers mm -hmm. um, and, and, and such. Um, in terms of what was done in mouse, that's really relatively recent from what I've seen. Um, and I, I haven't seen a standardized tool. I've seen some nice stuff where in which they try to quantify uh, fighting, and gait, uh, so movement of the legs, uh, but I haven't read anything that uh, really stood out. In flies, though, there's some great stuff coming mm -hmm. about um, from multiple groups, mm -hmm. So, and mostly from Genelia Farm, actually, mm -hmm. from what I've seen, although also from, I think, Pietro, uh, I, I think he was working at Caltech way back when, when uh, sorry, with, um, oh my god, he's, he's, you know, a huge Flying mouse guy, a huge mouse guy, um, David. Oh lordy, I'm gonna feel terrible forgetting his name now. He's this huge guy. Um, but basically, they did some work uh, in in quantifying uh, fly behavior, adult fly, because adult fly looks different than the larval stages, which is just worm-like. Um, but they they quantify things like fighting and uh, uh, mating sequences and such. And that work uh, 
was also taken on by um, by Kirsten uh, Branson, I think that's her name, at Janelle, and she has a beautiful paper also in Nature Methods where uh, they look at fly behavior and they do it in an unbiased way too. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned Martha, Martha Zlatic did some beautiful work with uh, Drosophila larva, so fly larva, to also quantify behavior. There's a lot, of, there's an explosion in the field. Um, the difference, there's a, two different ways to approach it, right? Um, one is to say, well, I don't want to be biased by what we already know about behavior. I want to take an unbiased approach to behavior, um, which is what Andre did in his paper. And I, I basically want to try to understand what uh, worms or flies do and, and not not say, you know, it doesn't have to be a human identifies. It has to just be something that's repetitive that I can kind of claim is, is the same thing. That's a difficult thing to do. It's been approached differently by different groups, um, and it, it produces some nice data. We've taken a different approach with this particular paper. So we're looking at things that humans actually care about. Um, and the reason is, is that when you talk about this unbiased approach, it's not necessarily meaningful. Um, it's difficult to understand what it means. You have to put it in context, you know. And most researchers don't operate from that reference frame is a good way to put it. So they say, well, I don't know what you mean by, you know, behavioral motif number blah, blah, blah or some eigenworm, you know, uh, projection, which is just basically a posture, you know, set of postures, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, I do understand forward movement. I want to know, is the worm pausing less, you know, under these circumstances? Is mm -hmm. it these omega terms? Because these have real meaning to me uh, as a human being, and they have real meaning to a worm. You know, a worm doesn't like to be touched, and it does these reverses, and it does omega terms. It's a motor pattern that's activated and I want to understand what led to changes in it because I'm I'm interested in that particular network you know for defecation too right defecation you know if you look at it in an unbiased manner you might actually find out that a lot of the movements are essentially separate movements that are used in other mm -hmm. situations right mm -hmm. a head contraction is a head contraction it is separate from a, a defecatory motor program um, so the, the collective intelligence is, is a different thing entirely, and that's how I've approached it. Um, you know, it has different strokes for different folks. You know, it really depends on what you're looking at and, and, and what you're trying to make sense of. You know, it's, I've tried to provide different views. In fact, we actually have the eigenworm projections in the data set, so you can look at a more unbiased view, and, and, and Andre has been working off of that to do his, his behavioral motifs. But, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, it's actually a really tough thing. It doesn't have a, a good answer to it. Mm -hmm. But yes, the answer is yes, there has been other work in, in other organisms, and it's not as definitive at this moment in time. Well, I would imagine that, you know, if you ask me this question 20 years from now, there will be a very quantitative set for most of the model organisms mm -hmm. in which people say, you know, I know exactly what this gene does when I mutate it in a mouse. You know, I can tell you specifically what's wrong with this mouse. Cool. Nice. Okay, other folks, other questions? Okay. And I have one last one. Sure. Someone else does. And then we'll close it out. So I kind of have to wear the open worm, the open worm hat real quick. And and so um, if we were to look at this data set in a classic machine learning uh, context, and we basically say that the target is to fit right to your data set. Um, would you, uh, I guess at what level of detail would, would have to convince you, what, what, what level of detail would, would we have to have to convince you that, uh, that there was actually a simulated worm, right, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, a, a, a fake? Would we, so are the high level 702 uh, feature statistics enough? Um, so if we basically had something and it uh, produces the waveform and it matches wild type, um, like 100%, do you think that that's sort of a sufficient capture of behavior? Um, do you think that it has to be at some deeper level of resolution, like uh, like a waveform level match? Um, what do you think? So what, what's your sort of uh, example of you can't tell the difference between a worm that you recorded and did, and did statistics on versus a simulation? Uh, let me tell you something terrible which, about me, which is basically that Andre built a simulated worm which is really simple, frankly, in, in MATLAB. Um, and it's, um, 
it's like, you know, maybe a page worth of code of that even, right? And it was meant to test out uh, how good is my analysis and the ability to capture the code. <laughs> and if I look at that, uh, aside from the way it's drawn, which is not terribly convincing, but, you know, if I look at how it moves, you know, the sine wave you created, I frankly, it looks very much to me like a worm in my own videos, you know, a worm off food. Because a worm without stimulus, you know, looks like a worm without stimulus. It's just randomly behaving. And, and, and if I'm looking at it, you know, if, if he had drawn it better, um, I would have been convinced. <laughs> Which is, I mean, that's really, I don't know if that says more about me or more about what a worm actually does behaving, <laughs> you know, either way. Um, but, by eye. By eye. Yeah, by eye. By, yeah, by eye. Um, you know, through your, yeah. If, okay, so now, now here's the thing, right? Um, it depends how you quantify that, right? Because, because one way to ask that question is to say, how much does this worm behave like the wild type, right? Um, and another way to ask that question is, does this worm convince a human being who's used to some assay that, in fact, this is the worm, right? Because people touch worms and they respond very, uh, in very sensitive ways. So the question is, really needs to be framed, in my opinion, needs to be framed with challenges, you know? And the challenges are things like, you know, chemotaxis assay, right? Or, or let's say touch assay, really simple one, right? I'm going to go with a virtual pick and I'm going to touch that worm, right? For a person who does these experiments daily, is, are they convinced, you know, that, they, you know, if they had a robotic hand, right? They, they don't know. They don't know if that robotic hand is, is translating to a real robotic hand or, or some other hand out there. And they do this. Yeah, they're they convinced that, in fact, they see a real worm behaving, right? And, and, and similarly, you know, you could go at the level of, um, is the regular, is the time series of data? If I just look at the worm moving, does it move like a wild type? What is, you know, I mean, um, it's very difficult because we don't have equations that define what is wild type movement. So you can't ostensibly plug it in and say what is the uh, root mean square difference, right? What is the mean square difference from an equation which would define it? So. But I guess I what I'm saying is, like, if I if I took Andre's worm, right, and I ran yeah. it for, and I ran, you said 20, 20 worms is the number that you need to, yeah, right. So I run, I run it 20 times with some random seed. It crawls around. It's a little virtual dish, right? Yeah. And, and I run and I run your 702, you know, statistics on it, and I measure it, you know, and it and if it matches wild type, you know, to what extent do you think that 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 is starts to be right? That uh, that it comes close. Do you think that Andre's thing would would come close to wild type? Do you think it would fall short in some way? I think that it would fall short. It would fall very short, in fact. And the reason is it doesn't pause. It doesn't do. It doesn't forge with its head. It doesn't do worm-like things. It it operates randomly at the level at which he coded the random uh, uh, <coughs> movement, right? Um, he could do something trickier, right? He could take the eigenworm projections, okay. and he could take them, and he could say, "Okay, is there what kind of what defines this? What's the limit of this equation? How does it transition from one moment to the next?" And he could form a set of equations. He could use those to define a fake worm, and that worm would probably fake out much of our representation of a worm, mm -hmm. except for events. So once again, it would probably fail in things like pausing. It would fail in things like um, for it might fail in things like forging. But if you extended the eigenworm enough, you probably would not miss out on those. And and so I think your question to some extent is, um, how many dimensions do I need to code a worm? You know, what is the dimensionality of worm behavior? One of the things that Andre is in fact addressing, right? So so I think when he answers that, you'll have your answer to some extent, right? you'll have your answer. What dimensions do I need to, to deal with? And if I represent all those dimensions, then I have essentially a worm that is no different from the ones that were quantified in video. And, and I have passed that Turing test. I think it's a, a potentially a very easy Turing test to pass to some extent. And it's amazing that no one has bothered to do it yet. I, mean, I think you should be able to do it within the next five years. I, I don't see any reason why you can't hit mm -hmm. that that goal. Now whether or not, here's the thing, going from eigenworms to real 
Mm -hmm. um, biology is not easy. Mm -hmm. You have all the muscles, you have all the neurons, but you don't know what those neurons do. You do know what the muscles do, you have no idea what the neurons do. Um, you, you know, this is Corey Bardman and Bill Schaefer and, and, and Marty Chalfie and everyone's big dream, right? What does, you know, Aravi's dream, what is a neuron, Piali's dream too, what is, many researchers, what does the circuitry do, you know? We have the connectome from 1980, right? And you can point to a few neurons here and there and say, yes, this is what they do. But, but only in the last two years do we know what things like AIY kind of do. We've added some stuff, you know, a particular set of neurons, AIY. Uh, and, and the challenge is much bigger than you would ever imagine, right? Because it's not just uh, neurons in, in this mix. We've been ignoring some really big things like, um, like uh, glia, you know, or <laughs> neuropeptides. One of the things I'm looking at now, right? What do they do? There's a large neuropeptide signaling going on in the worm, almost on the same order as its neurons, you know, and they all govern its behavior. So, so I think being able to fake a worm is one thing, but being able to know why a worm is doing stuff, we're, we're well off in that challenge. That's that's a 30-year challenge, probably, you know, mm -hmm. right there. Um, but Manuel Zimmer presented some stuff where you might not be as far off from answering that question as you think. Because he's got almost all neurons in the head of a worm now. And and he's seeing some stuff I'm not allowed to talk about, but uh, I mean, it's, it, it's mind-blowing when you can see a whole brain operating. It's not, it's it's so different. You know, it's a whole other challenge in and of itself. And and it's it's that dream, I think, that a lot of us have, have been, been, we've been dreaming about for a long time, right? You know, see a whole brain in action and, and, and really get a view into what it means to think. What does a memory look like? Goal and a sense, you know, what, what do these look like in a, in a neural network? Because it's all been theory now, right? We think there's a lot of evidence that points exactly to this, that it's a neural phenomenon, right? <laughs> but, but what is that neural phenomenon? What does it really look like when you get into 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 the into the brain. It's been only only a little taste of that so far, you know? Great answer. Great answer. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well um, we've we've uh, run over time but I thought that was good to get that get that last question in. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank uh, the panel, uh, Adam Adelivos, Balash, Dan, Jim, and Vanessa. Uh, and then uh, Ev, thank you so so much for presenting this work. Hey thank you for having me on. That was great. Thank you for uh, listening. You know, you do this work and you hope that somebody cares. <laughs> yeah. uh, if folks want to see this uh, after this, this will be up on YouTube, so you can uh, you can check it out later. And uh, look forward to the next uh, Open Worm Journal Club. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel and uh, follow it. Um, so uh, we'll break there. And uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you.